Hello everyone. In the last class we have seen about the choice of statistical test. Now we are going to see sample size calculation. So before going to the sample size calculation, it is my duty to convince you why sample size calculation is needed. So you just imagine if your objective is to just to assess the taste of the tea you want to drink the whole can of tea then how funny it is and as against if you put a drop on your tongue and if it is if the drop is not enough to rinse your tongue then you feel it is insufficient and you may give inaccurate results but what you ideally need is just a sip of tea so that you can tell exactly or correctly the taste of the tea likewise if you can if you do if you select large sample size you are going to lose your money time person it is not going to be feasible also you and moreover it is not ethical also now as against if you take a small sample you will get clinically significant results so what you ideally need is not very small not very large you need optimal or ideal sample size just as your sip of tea so here in this lecture we are going to see a great sample size one is using your classical formula and understanding the concept and feeding it in website and softwares and calculating the sample size for both of this you need to understand the concept and the terms behind sample size calculation so let us move there are commonly used these are all four commonly used categories either you want to estimate or you want to compare between groups and among estimation you may either check for proportion or mean and standard you may assess the prevalence of anemia in case of proportion but in case of mean and standard deviation you assess the mean hemoglobin level as against comparing groups whether male hemoglobin levels are the prevalence of anemia among males are different from females or from reproductive age group women from compared to elderly if you want to compare between two groups then you, you use this comparing uh, groups for sample size calculation now first we move on to the calculating the sample size when the proportion is the parameter of our study imagine we are calculating the prevalence of anemia you are going to detect the prevalence of anemia in a community that is your objective so here it is given by the formula n that is sample size n is equal to z square p q divided by d square where z is the standardized normal deviate or z value p is the proportion or prevalence of interest q is 100 minus p d is the clinically expected variation in the last few seconds you would have uh, scared about what i have uh, scared about the terms what i have told don't worry about it we are going to see that uh, uh, clearly in detail deviation so standard deviation is nothing but your you don't have to remember uh, the formula but you just glance at the formula here here if you see the formula n the sample number of sample is inversely proportional to your samples uh, standard deviation and further you calculate a term called this you calculate standard error for that value by using this standard deviation root of n again standard deviation 
is again inversely proportional to this uh, root of n. That is uh, standard error. Now, we have one more term called precision. What is precision is how we use this term, how precise you are going to be. So before doing the study, based on the prevalence found from the other study and the variability in your population, you decide, I am going to allow this much amount of error in my study or I am going to be this much precise in my study. You decide that level. That level is called as precision or allowable error. There are two types of precision. One is absolute and relative precision. Suppose if I want to study 20, a prevalence of anemia which was found as 20 percentage in previous study. In my study, I expect somewhere between 16 to 24. Then I am allowing an error of 4, 4 percentage on either side. So that is your precision. When I just say the exact number, that is called as absolute precision. So here in this case, the absolute precision is 4 percentage. When I want to tell in terms of relative precision, I can say it as 20 percentage of 20 percentage. Again, it will give 4 percentage. So when I want to clearly mention it as absolutely precision, it is 4 percentage. When it is relative precision, it is 40 percentage. That is 40 percentage of 20 percentage, which will give again 4 percentage. Then now you need to understand one more concept called confidence interval. So confidence interval is nothing but uh, it is the two standard errors, errors on the either side of the mean. So here you, you need to understand this confidence interval we get this after the study. So after the study what you for precision you allowed the error you assumed the error. But for uh, confidence interval, after finishing the study, you, you, you are at a point and you say, I have got this much amount of standard error on this side. So what is the inference of this confidence interval? So I have done the study. So based on my study, I am extrapolating from my small, small sample size. I am going to extrapolate it for the normal general population. So this general pop when I am going to extrapolate it for the general population, 95% of the true value it is going to be lying 90 with 95% confidence interval. I can say the true value is will be lying somewhere between this confidence interval on either sides. That is given by the formula mean into your uh, uh, plus or minus two standard errors. Before moving on to the next, uh, uh, before moving on to the formulas, that is the type of errors. At the end of the study, what you are going to make is the decision you are going to make uh, against the null hypothesis, that is. Sometimes null hypothesis. Sometimes null hypothesis may be true or may be false. But when there are two circumstances, you accept or reject. When you accept the null hypothesis, when it is actually true, you are correct. Your decision is right. When you, you are rejecting the null hypothesis, when it is false, again your decision is right. But you, you have the other two situations where you your judgment or the decision through the study is wrong. So here you either reject null hypothesis when it is true or accept null hypothesis when it is false, which are called as type 1 error or alpha error and type 2 error and beta error respectively. So now you, you may raise the question which error is 
superior. The, you can't decide uh, this. Uh, you have to decide based on the situations. Like I may argue that why you want to fail an MBBS student if he would have, if you commit an alpha error, which means he would have prepared nicely, you are rejecting his preparation. That is alpha error. How much painful for him? Don't do it. I may argue. The other person will argue. But if I commit a beta error, he is fall and falsely accepting his ill preparation. So I am committing a beta error which is going to harm the community. He is going to be the worst doctor, which I will not allow. So many people will decide these things based on the situation. So based on the study objective, you can decide which uh, error is uh, should be prioritized or not. Now this is just a table where you can where you can see this type of alpha error uh, that is a Z value for a particular alpha error. And if you decide a particular uh, from this table, what I want to uh, make you clear is for a particular p value, sorry, particular alpha error or a beta error, there is a constant z value which we substitute in that formula. This is called a standardized no, uh, normal deviate. So, uh, so we are not going to detail into these things. So now coming back to the original formula which I mentioned. So now, when the proportion is a parameter of our study, the sample size calculation is z square into pq divided by d square, where z is the standardized normal deviate or the z value, p is the proportion or prevalence of interest, q is the q 100 minus p, d is clinically expected variation, maybe absolute or relative. So if there is no prevalence, what will you do? Uh, so we have to do a thorough literature search before we decide whether there is no study or not. Then we do a, um, uh, if we uh, then if we didn't get any study, then we need to do a pilot study. From that data, we can calculate the sample size. So this is one more example which I am not going to deal in this session. So I am going to give this uh, in this after seeing this slide, you are going to uh, work out. So now we are going to how to write up this thing. So suppose if I got the result as 988 means we have we need to write like this in our thesis or an article. A sample size of 998 would be sufficient to observe 28% prevalence of anemia with 10% relative position and 95% confidence interval. And many websites give these things also while calculating sample size. And when mean is the parameter, parameter of our study, we just simply take out the PQ from this formula, PQ from this formula, and we replace it with S. Yes, that is nothing but your standard deviation, and the sum formula remains same. Here is one more example, which again I am not going to work out, which you are going to see with this slide. So this. The slide will give you this is a, will give you the picture for calculating the mean uh, sample size for est, uh, estimating the mean. Now we are moving on to the testing hypothesis between two groups. So uh, this is uh, when proportion is compared uh, among one group and the other group, then the formula is z alpha plus z beta all square into p q square. By divided by d square. So here, here we are including one more thing called the z alpha and z beta, and these are all will be constant based on your alpha level and beta level, based on the level of alpha error and beta error, which you decide before the study. And here, instead of here prevalence, which prevalence to consider? It is the average of two, um, uh, average of. Uh, uh, two proportions you just take and substitute with the p and q is 100 again same 100 minus p 
then d is your cleaning mechanically meaningful uh, difference between the groups so again this is one more example which i am not going to uh, detail into it you can if you are interested you can um, work out and uh, when again when the mean is a parameter of comparing one group with the other group then then the pq formula is replaced with a square formula again s is the common standard deviation between the two groups that is average between the two groups, uh, two groups. this is one more uh, example and here uh, the, if we adjust the beta uh, value uh, that is uh, with the 10 percent beta error you will land up in uh, cal uh, the sample size of 210 and if you have a beta value uh, beta error of 20 percentage then your sample size is uh, reduced to 157 that is when you increase your beta error your sample size reduces that is your power of the study decreases so after calculating the sample size you have few more steps to do that is calculating for the final po finite population that is you can reduce the sample size when your overall sample size is very less this is called as finite population correction it is given by the formula n is equal to that is the new n is equal to estimated uh, sample size n naught divided by 1 plus estimated sample size minus 1 divided by finite population now we have one more uh, we have to inflate the sample size for non-response or the dropout rate again we need to inflate the sample size that is the new sample size is equal to the calculated sample size divided by the response rate remember response rate we are not doing anything with the non-response rate but we are just dividing it with the response rate and if you if your study design has clusters then you should inflate the size based on the design effect design effect maximum it can be two minimum it can be one and design effect is decided by the rate of heterogeneity between these two groups and when the rate of heterogeneity is maximum you keep it as two when the rate of heterogeneity is minimum you keep it as one and there are different formulae for case uh, uh, different study designs that is case control study survival analysis and validation studies here i will uh, just give uh, this slide if you are interested you can see about diagnostic studies and to sum up this is the these are all the essential steps for estimating the sample size first you need to identify what is your type of variable that is whether you are going to assess the proportion or the mean you are going to estimate or compare then you determine the type then uh, you study variable then you determine the type of uh, estimate then indicate expected frequency of uh, factor of interest then decide on the desired precision of the estimate Pre the precision if your precision is big your confidence interval you are going your sample size is going to be small and your confidence interval is again going to be big decide on the alpha level uh, and beta error levels adjust for uh, population size adjust for design effect adjust for expected response rate with this the concept behind formulas is getting over now we have plenty of uh, websites and uh, softwares for calculating if you and one most commonly used uh, software uh, website is OpenMP that is uh, CDC's uh, own site where you can uh, find all these uh, terms which we have used and if you understand this uh, concept if you just put in the numbers they all cal will calculate and give the formula and there are many uh, identify uh, there are many websites where you can uh, get the format how you can write in your thesis or articles so it is given ready made uh, to you so you can use that all the best this is my uh, uh, references thank you